Topic four, dividends. Let's first look at definition and dates for dividends. Dividends are the distribution of wealth to shareholders. This can be done in the form of assets, cash or other assets, as well as shares. The important dates for the declaration for me for dividends include the declaration date. This is when the dividend is announced by the board of directors. The company has now entered into a contract to pay it and the payable is recognized. Think about how the date of declaration ties into your definition of a liability with past, present, future. The record date. This is the date of all of the shareholders on the state, otherwise known as shareholders of record. And these are the people that will receive the dividend declared on the declaration date. There's no journal entry relevant to this date of shareholders record. The ex-dividend date. Anyone who acquires shares on or after this date will not receive the dividend. No journal entry is required for the ex-dividend date. Payment date. Payment is made. We would then remove the payable and credit the asset or the share account. Cash dividends. On the declaration date, we would debit retained earnings or dividends declared, both debits to a shareholder's equity account, and we would credit dividends payable, which is a current liability as long as we were looking to pay it out within the current year. Then the next date in which we would record a journal entry would be on the payment date, where we'd debit or remove that dividends payable and credit the cash. If instead it was a preferred or common share dividend, then we must ensure that all preferred shares dividends are paid prior to the common dividend. For example, if we were to take a company with $2,001 dividend preferred shares outstanding, and if they declared a dividend of 1,000, all of that must first go, must go to the preferred dividends. If the company declared a dividend, a total dividend of 3,000, then 2,000 would go to the preferred shares, the 2,000 shares times the $1 dividend preferred shares, and the remainder would go to the common dividends. Common and preferred dividends must be recorded and reported separately. That brings us to cumulative preferred dividends. For preferred shares, the pardon me, for preferred shares, they may have features that are either cumulative or non-cumulative. Cumulative means that any preferred dividends not paid in prior years must be paid first in the current years. Those dividends from prior years unpaid are referred to as dividends in arrears. Preferred dividends, preferred shares may also be non-cumulative. This refers to any unpaid preferred dividends from prior years. Those do not need to be paid in current year. Friendly reminder, dividends in arrears are not a liability as there is never a guarantee that the company will declare and pay the dividends. Therefore, the second criteria of re represents a present obligation that the company cannot get out of doesn't qualify here. Therefore, it does not meet the definition of a liability. However, any dividends in arrears must be noted in the financial statements. Preferred shares may be participating, meaning holders of participating preferred shares may receive dividends beyond their stated preferred dividends if the declared dividend is large enough and if this feature existed upon the share issuance. If these exist, the order of dividend payment would be preferred dividends. Any excess is then, is then paid to common shareholders at a specified amount, and any excess beyond that is divided between all shareholders. The division of the excess can be done on a number of shares outstanding, where the base dividends per class or the total capital balance of each class. Preferred shares can be partially participating, where any dividend paid in excess of the stated dividend is capped at a specified amount, and any dividends declared above this amount go to exclusively to the common shareholders. The moral of the story here is that dividends and their related um, dividends for their shares, so preferred or common, these are legal contracts. 
people are investing in your company and there are going to be a number of terms attached to this investment. So it is important that when we are accounting students answering these questions, we look at the contract, which in our instance would be looking at the question and understanding the nuances and the features for each of these types of shares, know what is possible, and then make sure that our accounting reflects this possibility. The other dividends that we haven't talked about are property dividends, liquidating dividends, and script dividends. Property dividends are when are dividends paid with non-cash assets. They may also be referred to as dividends in kind. These dividends are recorded at the fair value of the asset and a gain or loss is recorded on that distribution. So the fair value minus the book value. The liquidating dividends is a return of the initial amount paid to repurchase shares to the shareholders instead of earnings. We discussed this in a previous topic. If that was the instance, we would debit the accounts other than retained earnings, so related contributed capital accounts first, and then share capital. Companies must state and disclose whether or not this dividend is a return of capital. Script dividends. This is when a dividend is issued using a promissory note and a cash dividend will be paid on maturity of that note. This is often done to maintain, maintain the dividend policy, but without paying out the cash at that time. A stock dividend is a proportional issuance of additional shares to existing shareholders. For example, if a company has 100,000 shares outstanding and issues a 20% stock dividend, after the dividend, they will have 120,000 shares outstanding. Then, if an individual shareholder has a thousand of those original 100,000 shares after the stock dividend, they would now have 1,200. This does not affect the balance of the assets, liabilities, or equity or ownership percentage. The reasons why a company may choose to issue stock dividends could include to shelter part of the equity from future dividends, so stock dividends decrease retained earnings and increase contributed capital, so the dividend amount cannot be paid out in future dividends. Perhaps it is to decrease the market price of the shares because we're increasing the number of shares outstanding. If you think to a previous topic, we would buy back shares to decrease the number of shares outstanding, which would then increase the market value. This would be doing the opposite. This could be to signal also the higher future cash dividends. So historically, cash dividends increase after a stock dividend, so declaring one can be used to send this message. Shareholders may choose to participate in a dividend reinvestment plan, otherwise known as a DRIP. This means that shareholders can either choose a cash or a stock dividend. Essentially, this would allow shareholders to immediately reinvest their cash dividends into the shares of the company. And this would result in an increase into the contributed capital. How do we account for stock dividends? We would then, we would debit the retained earnings and we would credit the share capital account. There are no specific standards when determining the share value. So we can look at three options. One is the fair value method, which would be to capitalize the current fair value of the issued shares, the market price per share on the date of declaration. We could also use the stated value method to capitalize a stated amount per share as determined by the board of directors, if this is permissible by the jurisdiction. There could be a memo entry. If a stock dividend is done to reduce the price per share, shareholders haven't actually received anything. In this case, only a memo entry is recorded. This is equivalent to the treatment of a stock split. If you recall from a prior video, a memo entry is one that doesn't debit or credit um, the face of the financial statement, so the statement of financial position, but rather it is to reflect the economic reality that there are more stocks outstanding. So we would see an increase to the number of shares outstanding. Some other things to consider. 
there may be a special stock dividend. And this is when a stock dividend is paid in a class of shares other than the current, other than the class currently held by a shareholder. So for example, a common shareholder receives a preferred shares via a dividend. Fractional shares, stock dividends um, may create pieces of shares called fractional shares. So for example, if you own one share and receive a 20% dividend, you would then own 1.2 shares. In this instance, when companies issue fractional share rights, um, that can absolutely be received. So meaning you could own 1.2 shares. Alternatively, companies may choose to pay the market value of those fractional shares so that um, the number of shares outstanding remains a whole um, in aggregate for me for each shareholder remains a whole number. So instead of issuing 1.2 shares, um, those fractional shares from the shareholders may um, receive the rounded portion in cash. So that's instead of issuing um, the fractional shares to that shareholder. Let's look at a question. GHI has 30,000 common shares and 15,000 cumulative preferred shares with a stated dividend of $2. Outstanding. The company paid 40,000 in dividends in 2018 and 5,000 in dividends in 2019. The company will pay 80,000 in dividends in 2020. How much of these dividends will go to the common shareholders? Is it A, zero, B, 50,000, C, 25,000, or D, 55,000? The correct answer is C. So let's look at the preferred shares, and they are cumulative preferred shares. So in 2019, only 5,000 dividends were paid out. The cumulative preferred shareholders are entitled to 15,000 times two, so 30,000 in dividends in 2019, but they only received 5,000. Okay, and so they were entitled to 30, only received five, so that means that there's 25,000 outstanding from prior year. So we first have to pay out the 25,000 to preferred shareholders for those dividends in arrears. Then they'd be entitled to their 30,000 from this year. So then that would be 80,000 less 25 plus 30, 55,000, which leaves 25,000 remaining for the common shareholders which is why C is the correct answer. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.